welcome to this afternoon's program. It's an amazing uh, lineup of individuals that we have here. We're going to explore the different philanthropic models uh, that support women globally. Uh, as we were talking earlier this afternoon, they both approach things from a venture capital mindset. Jacqueline's focus has been on investing in entrepreneurial activities, while Kavita's has been overseeing the giving of grants and aid development worldwide. They will address the questions of when one, does one model work better than the other, why, and how do they each decide whom to fund. Um, William Blair has been very excited about being more involved with the council. We've had a long and uh, storied history with the council, 75 years as an investment firm uh, in and around Chicagoland. Um, we've also enjoyed being very active personally in these efforts, but I would say uh, this uh, has struck a chord with me. Uh, after our first year with the series, we were hopeful uh, that it would have the effect that it has, but as I look around the room, there's absolutely no question uh, garnering the focus, the impact, uh, the spirit of many of the inv individuals in the room. I'm just very glad that uh, Blair has joined this dimension of involvement to increase awareness uh, for the benefits of providing opportunities to over half of the population in the world. And joining uh, us, Abbott Labs, is very exciting as well. Um, I would also say that, uh, as I know many of you in the room, we've given an enormous amount of our time, our talent, our resources uh, to aiding uh, the world in small ways and very large ways. But I would say after having sat with uh, these three women over a brief uh, lunch, and it's uh, humbling to say the least, um, they set a standard for all of us in that regard. Their bios are uh, detailed at your tables, but let me just by way of brief introduction uh, introduce the three of them. Jacqueline no Nova Novogratz, sorry, uh, is founder and CEO of Acumen Fund, a nonprofit global venture fund that uses an entrepreneurial approach to solve the problems of global poverty. She began her career with Chase Manhattan Bank and then founded a microfinance institution in Rwanda. Her best-selling memoir, The Blue Sweater, Bridging the Gap Between Rich and Poor in an Interconnected World, was published in 2009. Kavita Ramdas served as president and CEO of the Global Fund for Women from 1996 to September of 2010. The Global Fund for Women is a grant-making foundation that advances human rights by investing in women-led organizations worldwide. She is a visiting fellow and scholar at Stanford University's Center for Philanthropy and Civil Society, as well as the Center for Democracy, Development, and Rule of Law at the Freeman Spigoli Institute of International Affairs. She is a member of Global Development Advisory Panel of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Advisory Panel of the Asian University for Women, and the Board of Trustees of Princeton University. I actually tailored that down by like 25%. So. <laughs> And Margot Pritzker, very well known to this group, is a member of the Board of Directors of the Chicago Council and founder and president of WomenOnCall.org, which provides women and not-for-profits an online meeting place to forge skill-based volunteer opportunities. She has overseen the initiation and progress of schools in remote areas of the Himalayas and Afghanistan and supports Ghana's Ashesi University. She is also a trustee of the Aspen Institute, among many other civic involvement. Please join me in welcoming these three amazing women to the podium. Thank you. And uh, thank you all for being here uh, this afternoon for what I hope will be a very productive um, uh, hour. Um, I'm going to start off by um, asking both Jacqueline and Kavita to um, go beyond their bio and tell us in a more personal way uh, about what they do um, and how they do it. Um, and then we will go on to different models that they both have observed, not only from what they do, but what other people have done, of what works and what doesn't work. And then we'll finish with a question about uh, why women, why now, and get both of their views on that. And then what I'd like to do is open it up to all of you to have a uh, robust Q&A where we can dig even deeper onto issues of leadership, education, health, or whatever else you would like to violence uh, against women, whatever else you would like to talk about. So Jacqueline, would you like to start? Sure, thank you, Margot. And it's really wonderful to be here this uh, afternoon. 
Um, I, uh, my background essentially started in banking, as you know, and then moved through microfinance in the mid-80s in Rwanda with a small group of Rwandan women. Uh, and the experience there, particularly after genocide, when I discovered that the women with whom I had worked played out every role of the genocide, including being major perpetrators, made me step back, uh, really not only to think about what it means to be human at the deepest level, but can't we do a better job at building systems? Recognizing that we have capital at our disposal, not in just two buckets of the philanthropic money or the finances, financial money, but that, that money was money. And could we do a better job of actually investing in solutions that specifically looked at the poor, not as passive charitable recipients, which is what we do too often when we look at international development, but as full human beings that want to change their own lives, that want to make their own decisions. I often say that charity alone will not solve problems of the poor and the financial markets alone will not. But if there's one lesson that I've really learned over and over and over through 25 years of this work, it's that dignity really is more important to the human spirit than wealth. We are not very good as a world at measuring dignity. We are not very good as a world at really conferring honor on the, the units of, of what it means to be human, human worth. And so what we developed in 2000, 2001 with the Acumen Fund was this idea that maybe we could use philanthropic capital, not strictly just for grant making, but truly to invest in those entrepreneurs that were working in fully underserved markets that had been, were either invisible to uh, financial investors or in many times invisible to government or just not served by anyone that were really lost. And when you look at the basics, water, healthcare, housing, alternative energy, uh, you can see literally in many cases billions of people who have no access. And yet ideologically we always fight with each other. Water is a human right. No, water is an environmental resource and should be priced accordingly. And at Acumen Fund we always think that there's a middle way. So we identified this idea of patient capital. Invest philanthropic money, leave it for a really long time so that these entrepreneurs could experiment, fail, try again, learn what it takes for a poor woman to make a decision to buy water or to buy preventive health care. Uh, and then as you grow, measure everything that you can and find the stories to, tell, to measure that which you cannot so that ultimately you can, what we call scale these um, enterprises, grow these enterprises literally to reach millions and ultimately, we think, uh, change systems. And so we've invested about $50 million in Pakistan, India, Kenya, and Tanzania. And that has leveraged about $200 million into these companies that are not only created 35,000 jobs, but now are literally bringing in tens of millions of services. Just quickly, a couple of examples would be uh, long-lasting malaria bed nets. 95% uh, of people who get malaria are in Africa, and yet 100% of the nets had been manufactured in Asia. So we identified an African entrepreneur in Tanzania, really believing that Africans can solve their own problems. And uh, long story short, money's been paid back to us, but there's now a company that has 8,000 employees, 90, over 90% of whom are women, making 30 million bed nets a year, which provides coverage to about 50 million people. And when we take people into that factory, it blows away their imagination about what Africa is capable of doing. Um, toilets in Africa, a huge mess. One in two people in Kenya have no access to sanitation. So rather than, again, being in corners, built a company that works with government, and this year, 10 million people will use these toilets. Maternal health care. Um, things like ambulances that you don't really think about until five years ago in Bombay, 90% of people who were in ambulances were dead. You only called them to go to the morgue. You want to go to the hospital, you call a taxi. And so, and it was frankly the same way in the 1930s in the United States when um, ambulances were fully privatized and highly corrupt as they are in India. And so a company builds a different model. If you're poor, you're taken to a free public clinic. You pay what you can afford, otherwise you pay to the hospital. The biggest piece here is marketing, transparency in the service delivery, and no corruption. Not rocket science. And 
It was a private sector company. We bought 30% of it. Now it works in, in coordination with government. We've grown it from nine ambulances to um, 280 right now, but it, they have contracts for 1,000 ambulances. It's, it's, again, it's changing the imagination. And so that's how we think about everything we do uh, using an investment model, but having the humility to realize that at the end of the day, the way we measure our returns as a world has been warped. And we need to think more expansively about what it means to use our money and use our, finan our human resources to create a world where everyone gets access. Thanks, Jacqueline. Um, I want to come back to, so you can describe patient capital to everybody, but Kavita, why don't Margaret you? gets really frustrated with, me with my patient capital descriptions. <laughs> we'll, we'll, come, we'll come back to that with the next question. Go ahead, Kavita. So um, you. Good afternoon. Um, I'm also really delighted to be here. It's always a pleasure to come back to the place where I um, began my work in the field of philanthropy. I was a program associate at the MacArthur Foundation in some previous avatar. So um, it's really nice to be back and thank you for the invitation to join you. Um, Jacqueline just described a, a model that I think um, we think of at the Global Fund for Women as being uh, incredibly complementary to the way in which the Global Fund envisions how to make change and invest in um, women and girls. Um, unlike the Acumen Fund, which is actually relatively recent um, creation, um, the Global Fund for Women was established in 1987, right after the Nairobi Conference for Women, which was one of the very first um, gatherings of women activists from around the globe. Um, some 15,000 of them from d different countries were in one place at the same time, and three of the founders of the Global Fund for Women um, spent time meeting and talking with women activists, uh, some of them working on environmental issues, some of them working on peace and security issues, some of them working on um, violence um, and access to education. And the one thing that they seemed to share was that although um, the mid-80s was a time when there was growing awareness about the need to include women and girls in the development plans of developing countries, in the sort of um, economic um, um, development of those countries, uh, the, tr the reality was that very little philanthropic capital was actually going to women and girls. And so large philanthropic entities like the Rockefeller Foundation or the Ford Foundation or Carnegie were investing internationally, but they were investing mainly in large um, uh, universities or research institutions. And they certainly weren't giving money to a group of um, you know, 10 women who decided that they wanted to end the practice of child marriage in their community. Um, the founders of the Global Fund, um, all being based, um, the Global Fund uh, was um, conceived of in Palo Alto in California, which as you all know is uh, the heart of Silicon Valley. And I think there was a real sense that, you know, what could we do? Now we're going to use another term for capital. You, you might want Jacqueline to explain patient capital. But I think there was a real sense amongst the founders of the Global Fund, what could women do if you actually made um, seed capital available to them. Not that this was, you know, somebody in the United States going out to another country and running a project, but really that you were responding to what women were already doing in their own communities, ideas that they already had, but that they sim simply couldn't take it to the next level without an investment of financial resources. And my best comparison for that is if you think about what Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Alice um, and um, people like Alice Paul um, were up against in the early part of uh, this the previous century in the United States, uh, think of what the suffragettes might have benefited from if someone had said, here's $5,000, and instead of just 10 people coming to the meeting in Seneca Falls, you could have half of the East Coast um, you know, be brought in on buses, and you could use this money for posters, and you can stand outside the White House um, much longer because somebody will be, be able to feed and you know, bring um, reinforcements. I say that because I think um, much of the work of the Global Fund for Women has focused on the deep gender inequalities that exist um, across the world that essentially um, put women at a place where they're often not even considered human. Um, I spent time in Ethiopia where um, a group of rural women uh, turned to us and um, literally said, you know, until this organization, the Ethiopian Women Lawyers Association, that was a grantee recipient of the Global Fund, came to spend time with us in rural villages, uh, we thought we were less worth than the goats in our community. And that is actually not an 
exaggeration of any form. In many of our languages, including in India, um, there are phrases that, you know, what the last piece of bread that's left on a plate should better be fed to a goat than to a woman because it isn't actually worth it to feed it to a woman. So the, the level at which women's value has been um, diminished in so many societies required, in a way, an investment in those brave women who were willing to sort of challenge the status quo. And so the grants that the Global Fund makes are, in fact, to the people like the early um, suffragettes um, who are questioning what has been long established, both cultural tradition, economic norms, actual legal norms. Uh, there are many places in the world where women literally don't have the legal right to own or inherit property. Um, so grants to women's lawyers associations. I know lawyers have a bad rap in the United States, not at the Global Fund for Women. We think they do amazing work around the world. Um, and they're, they're, um, so I think that's the model that we have really used in terms of, and then I think the, on the other side, let me say two words about how we mobilize those resources, because I think that's a very important part of this model as well. Um, the Global Fund for Women wasn't started by Bill Gates or by Nelson D. Rockefeller or by Henry Ford. It was started by three women who had no money of their own, but each put $500 of their own money on the table and then went out and got 31 individual investors to put an additional $5,000 each. They included people like Bill Hewlett and David Packard, who thought this was an interesting new kitchen startup, not quite a garage, but... Um, <laughs> And, and I think that there is real power in that as well, because I think the notion that you don't have to wait to make a difference in the world until you are as powerful or as rich or as um, influential as someone like a Bill Gates is incredibly critical for us to be able to begin to think about how we make change on the things that actually a small amount of money can actually be a catalyst for wider ripples of change. And so that's the last piece I wanted to add on that. No, that's, and, and we can continue that conversation when you give us some examples of um, investing in, I know you don't just do, yours is uh, not gender specific um, at Acumen, but um, investing small amounts in uh, people and companies to make a big difference. Can you give us some examples of that and what patient capital means? Yeah, um, we don't invest such uh, well, it's all, it's all relative, but uh, whereas Kavita is talking about $5,000 grants, right. um, that's a really important difference between us. Um, our average investment is about a million dollars, and so we are uh, we're kind of further up the the financial stream, if you will, um, in part because we're building real companies that can reach millions. Of, an example I sometimes give as a way of explaining patient capital is drip irrigation. So drip irrigation was um, created in Israel in the 1960s. It's a way of, in desert and drought prone areas, going from a water source and taking tiny tubes of water and dripping water at the stalk of the plant. In fact, it would be a great metaphor for what you do. Um, exactly. Really dripping small things to watch uh, beauty bloom in the desert. And, uh, Amitabha Sadangi, who's actually a friend of mine and has been working with smallholder farmers for 25 years in India, there are 200 million farmers making a dollar a day or less, had huge frustration that smallholder farmers were never going to get access to the large-scale commercial uh, equipment that was drip irrigation because it had only been made for commercial use. And the charities were really uncomfortable. Um, lending or giving or, or really working with the farmers as as customers and so would often give them in a well-intended way seeds and fertilizers and inputs but usually that were the wrong wrong type wrong time so he thought i need to do two things i need to understand this israeli technology but as important i need to understand who these farmers are um, again investors aren't going to put money into a prototype for the risk, most risk averse population on the planet who makes on average a dollar a day. Um, just not seemingly a great business proposition. And so uh, Amitabha got a grant and started prototyping, listening to how the farmers make decisions. The first is that he understood that they had to do miniaturization, that they would risk a quarter of their acre but no more. So he had to compartmentalize this all the way down to a quarter acre. Second. Um, 
it had to be extreme affordability. Within one harvest, they had to be able to repay what they borrowed or the money that they had for the first and third incre incremental and infinite expandability that with the f you could buy your first quarter acre and your second and your third and your fourth. So started with grants. When the prototype was identified, Acumen came in with the patient capital, long-term $300,000 loan to help him build this nonprofit business. Once 300,000 farmers had purchased these units and we saw that a doubling and tripling of their income, we actually created a for-profit company. Uh, we own half of it and uh, IDE India owns the other half. It's called Global Easy Water Products. It's been running for a few years and it primarily focuses on um, selling within India but also exporting to scale this company. And last week we got our first $17,000 dividend check, which was a <laughs> big good. deal. That's great. Um, <laughs> which is really great. But we're seeing, you know, 400,000 farmers is 2 million individuals who through their own means are changing their lives fundamentally. Patient capital is allowing a system that is rigorous and that over time allows now Global Easy Water Products to actually access other forms of capital so that it can grow from a $4 million company, which is where it is now, to what we believe in the next four to five years will be a $25 million company serving people who've just never really been seen before. And so that's, that's patient capital. Yeah, okay. Now that explains it well. So models that you're doing. Um, I think the, the interesting um, contrast is in, in some ways it's about what do you envision in terms of how do you move societies from one stage in their own development to a different one. And that's why I gave the example of the suffragettes, because everybody takes women's rights for granted now in the United States, as though sort of somehow one morning the West woke up and said, oh, you know, of course we meant to include you. We were so sorry. Um, and of course, that isn't, that isn't what happened. A bunch of crazy, and Jacqueline has used this term to describe social entrepreneurs that they invest in, a bunch of crazy women who believe that um, you know, we believe this to be true, self-evident, that all men and women are created with certain inalienable rights, um, pertained to 50% of the population that had been left out of that conversation. And that's a conversation that is happening similarly, but in a telescoped period of time. You have to remember that in a country like mine, where I grew up in India, uh, my parents grew up in an India that still has signs saying dogs and Indians not allowed. So in 60 years, part of what is so challenging about both what Jacqueline is doing in the developing world and what the Global Fund for Women is doing in terms of investing in women's voices, women's leadership, women's rights, is that we are doing what it took the West 500 years to do in terms of establishing separation of church and state, in terms of having an industrial revolution, in terms of being able to um, move quickly to kind of create new forms of development. And I would say that part of what the Global Fund has um, seen as an opportunity here is to say, okay, so if democracy was created very quickly and we have, you know, um, voting systems and, 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 a, and a government that's elected, how do we make democracy more real than just holding an election? And you all know this from everything you've read about Iraq and Afghanistan. It is not enough to hold an election to create democracy. What you need is people in that democracy who really believe that the government is there to work for them, that the issues of transparency that Jacqueline spoke about are issues that average citizens actually have a right to inquire about, that women have actually the rights to um, what is beautifully enshrined in many of these constitutions, but rarely actually makes it into any form of lived reality for women on the ground. And I think the models that I have been inspired by in terms of what we've been able to support and strengthen in that sense is sort of creating a civil society, if you will, the kind of, the kind of organizations that Alice de Tocqueville marveled at at America when he came from France and noticed you know, things like the PTAs and the Chamber of Commerce and um, uh, women's associations like Hull House in Chicago. Um, those are the kinds of institutions that the grants that the Global Fund for Women makes are helping to establish. But we're also helping to establish um, a set of um, shifted expectations about what are the areas within which women can actually be leaders. So 
Yes, we fund the violence hotlines, but we also fund women farmers who are challenging pesticide use in, chi in China. And yes, we fund um, uh, uh, girls' education programs, but we also fund associations of business owners who are like, it's all very well to do microcredit, but we actually want to grow our businesses. So we need to have access to better education, better information, and then hopefully going through a program like that helps them learn something about the existence of something like an Acumen Fund, helps them feel like they're in a position to be able to make a presentation and to talk about what it might take to sort of take this to the next level. So I would say that's where there has been, um, you know, in terms of our experiences, um, the kinds of things that we have chosen to invest in have really been small associations of women who have begun to question the status quo in their own societies, but in a myriad of fields. Um, I'll end with one example in Liberia in 2003. Jacqueline spoke about the devastation of the Rwandan genocide. And, you know, I'm like Jacqueline, not convinced that women are any different than any other human beings in terms of what we can do, both good and bad. But I think um, the one thing that maybe motivates women in a way that is profoundly significant is that they are mothers and that their engagement and their concern for children and the next generation. Um, makes them very committed to being able to sort of shift the environment in certain ways. And we made a grant to a group of women who were protesting Charles Taylor's policies in Liberia, um, a film that if you guys get a chance to see is called Pray the Devil Back to Hell. Um, a woman called Lema Bowie, who was an early grantee in 2003, um, who just began to gather women on the side of the road as Charles Taylor's motorcade passed by, just saying, women want peace, we're sick of this civil war. And that grew to be a sort of a national movement to push for peace talks. Um, so it can be the whole gamut, really, in terms of all the way from economic empowerment to political participation. If I could just make an additional plug to what Kavita said and to what the work that she's been doing, because you said something, and, and I, I don't want it to get lost, um, in that um, it, it took the West a long, long time, and now we're expecting real change to happen very, very quickly. And I think one of the issues we de deal with as a world is just how fast everything is changing for all of us. And I think it's one of the reasons we're seeing real divides in this country um, that are no different in some ways than the divides we're seeing around the world. And people are almost in a sense of panic mm -hmm. that we're being asked to take on all of these new identities, and they're so frightening that they pull in. Mm -hmm. and in societies where the poor are oppressed, and obviously in the countries in which we work, there is real oppression. Uh, maybe there's this piece of like, if I'm gonna be kicked by people all day long, at least I can come home and beat my wife and feel a little bit better. And I think that that's a dynamic that we don't really talk about enough and deal with enough. And I think that in a way that's, when we talk about things changing, yeah, these, these societies are changing very quickly, but at the same time, there's another dynamic of, sort of, pushback. of pushing back yeah. that needs to be yeah. kind of lifted and dealt yeah. with. And yeah. so, you know, and I, I think that's a great segue into talking about what we were talking about um, before this lunch, about um, dispelling some of the myths of um, giving to women, uh, whether it's education, health, empowerment, political status. Um, the sort of global picture that it's it's not as simple as educate every woman and you know if we do that then x y and z will happen and we'll have a wonderfully peaceful world well i mean i think the the important thing that jacqueline is mentioning and you know we've seen this time and time again um i think of a group that we support in pakistan in a in an afghan community in karachi um, very conservative, very traditional, um, and it, it was a remarkable young woman in that community who had um, a very supportive brother who was able to start a small center where women could come to study, and it began with sort of studying the Quran, um, and so that they could read, because it says in the Quran that, you know, um, the first thing every Muslim should be able to do is to read, so that you can read the Quran for yourself. Um, and it was interesting because when I met with her, she said, you know, Didi, um, big sister, elder sister, um, she said, you know, for many years, um, these very nicely dressed women used to come from 
upper class communities in in uh, in Karachi, and they used to descend on our um, uh, basti, on our slum community, and then they would immediately line up all the poor women, and they would ask us. Um, so, does your husband beat you? How much domestic violence have you suffered? What is the situation with, you know, would you like to be able to come to a shelter? And they said, and Didi, they never asked us, um, are you feeding your children? Do you have a job? Does your husband have a job? Are you managing okay? How will you, how will you take care of the issues um, that you currently face? And she said, until we can, together as a family, she said, all of us are poor. We are not, women are not existing in a vacuum, separate from our husbands, our brothers, our children. Um, and we want to be able to make this better for all of us. And when we are a little bit stronger and when everybody is eating, then yes, maybe I can say to my husband, I don't want to be beaten. And I want to have a conversation with you about how, I mean, I, the, um, some of the most effective domestic violence strategies have been um, women saying to men, how can we stand by you and be strong with you if you continually destroy us and make us weak? And I think that that is something that we are also learning. I think when you do this work, particularly in non-Western societies, um, and where, as Jacqueline said, the poverty is so overwhelming, you don't start from this place of like, well, you know, it's my right. You know, as a woman, I have a right. And so, you know, you start from a place of like, what is the reality for the community? And then within that, you start in a process of, of education. And I'm not saying that, by the way, as an excuse, because there are travesties of human rights violations that we now know and understand as human rights violations, and they should be called as such. But it is about being able to understand that we are trying to change societies as a whole. And, and not try and think about it as, as though we're doing something in isolation um, from everything else. And then we were talking about this before, ways around that you don't yeah. have to always confront. Directly, um, I remember exactly. a conversation in Afghanistan sitting with a group of women who had set up schools for little girls. And it was the village that had set them up. And I said to them, well, what do your husbands feel about this? And they said, we're, they're very proud of us as long as we get everything else done that we're supposed to do as women. <laughs> I thought, I've heard this one before. <laughs> this doesn't that sound familiar. <laughs> um, but yes, we were talking about this. It's not always we were, the frontal approach. Well, one of my favorite quotes is by Martin Luther King, who says that love without power is anemic and sentimental, and power without love is reckless and abusive. And I think often, um, particularly when we talk about women, we really move into the anemic and sentimental part of the brain. And one of the things I sometimes talk about is the risk of over-empathy at the risk of sounding like a really cruel uh, person up here because what Kavita is talking about is are we dealing with women in the same respectful way that we would want to be treated ourselves or we would deal with men? I learned this really young. When I was 25, in addition to starting this bank, I started a bakery with 25 uh, single mothers who were called prostitutes and I was so excited to be changing the world with them. And so I put in some pretty lax systems where they would fill up their buckets with you know, really poorly baked goods and then sell them in, in the community. And we would make all this money and change their lives. And within the first week, I realized they were ripping me off blind. Um, <laughs> and I was so crushed that I was, I was getting up at 4 in the morning so I could run over there and get this thing going, and then I'd work all day on building the bank, and then I'd come over there at night, and there was clearly no appreciation. And, and what I realized through them quickly was they were testing me. How soft is this one? And um, I was really soft <laughs> for a day. <laughs> and I was like, Maybe wait a minute, too. I know this game. And we flipped it. It was like, you are going to be accountable every single day. And if you don't bring back the number that is the, the, you bring cash or you bring goods back and you're paying. And, and actually holding women to that level of account, which was incredibly painful at the beginning because I knew where they lived. I knew how much money they made. And over time, not only was there no stealing, but they doubled and tripled their income levels. And I watched them transform overnight. So you take that tiny story of a little bakery and you extrapolate it to the way we think about people around the world. And for me, it's how do we build these systems that bring voice and accountability. So our bed net factory, 
which was not perfect when we started um, on many measures. And in fact, when I brought my hedge fund brother first to visit it, he was like, so you're using my philanthropic money to fund a sweatshop? And I was like, it's not, first of all, it is not a sweatshop. Second of all, these women, let me just be clear here, make the top, they make two to three dollars a day, which is the top 20% of income earners in Tanzania. And third, our grandmother, my cousin Heidi's here somewhere, um, our grandmother worked in a real sweatshop. And if you closed your eyes and I described her to you, you would think African woman. She had nine children, three died before they were five years old. She suffered from all kinds of diseases. My grandfather was a cement hauler, incredibly gruff man. My grandmother and her five sisters um, would not eat until everyone else had eaten. And two generations later, I see these women in a factory in Tanzania, and not only am I watching their lives change overnight, but now they've unionized. And it's a really different factory. <laughs> and that's how change happens too, but it's, it's a mix of heart and head yeah. that's sometimes very uncomfortable to us as a world, particularly when we are looking at people who we feel are the most yeah. marginalized. And actually, I want to say something about that in terms of how that's played out in the governance structure of the Global Fund, which has also been in education. And Adele used to serve on our board. Um, the Global Fund decided right at the very beginning that we would have the women who we were going to invest in as board members and as advisors on the ground. And what we were really struck by, sort of, you know, here we would be the staff saying, oh, here's this really moving grant for you know, this group of women in Sudan, and they're like struggling against all these odds. And the people who would be the toughest, absolute toughest, on sort of reviewing the grant were all the other grassroots women, in the, you know, Rita from Nepal and Hope from Zimbabwe and um, uh, Mayan from the Philippines. And they were like, no, they haven't done this. They haven't thought about this. This question hasn't been asked. They're not, where are the accountability factors? How do people in the community know that? And we'd be like, yeah, but you're talking about like poor women, you know? And the, they're like, yeah, we've been there. We know what those communities are like. And it was the exact same experience that Jacqueline described. Um, and I would say, you know, when people say, well, how do you know that your like $5,000 isn't being used to, you know, go off for a vacation down the Zai, down the Zai River or something? I'm like, uh, no, actually, it's really interesting. As in microcredit, you know, remember the circles that um, you might have heard about that, you know, until one woman repays her loan. So our experience at the Global Fund has been very interesting on the issue of making grants. So the minute you make a grant to a women's group in one community, everybody in the community knows about it. They also know who our advisors are in the community. When the next group comes to make its application to the Global Fund, they've either gotten recommended or advised or whatever, everybody's watching really keenly. And the network is an incredible network. So you find what we found actually has helped on the accountability issue is much more groups watching out for each other because nobody wants to be like, well, how come you got $5,000 but we got 20, you know? Or how come they only got 15 but we got 20? Um, and making that as open, as transparent as possible and learning from the women who are on the ground who are often the much more harsh critics and much more realistic in terms of kind of what needs to get done. And I think just in terms of sort of thinking through governance structure, that's an important piece, particularly as we think about how do we want to keep this accountability piece. Right. And, and, and the, you know, the more grassroots you get, um, the more significant that is. And I feel like particularly after 9-11, we learned that also with regard to the whole, you know, we had to, be, we had to run by all our grantees against the terrorist list. Now, that was an exciting um, process. Of course, one thing that helped is almost all the names on that list were male names. Right. <laughs> so one, one last question from up here before we turn it over to all of you is the, um, what you'd said at the beginning, the dignity and the listening. You both have stories about um, going in with assumptions and not listening. And you know, I think of yours again with the bakery um, and your color blue. And, and I think about you, Kavita, talking about uh, female circumcision. Mm. Um, and so I, I, if you could talk, both talk about those or any other one you want to talk about, and then we will turn it over to you for your questions. Um, I often say that the, marketing is, the market is the best listening device that we have. And 
What I mean by that is, uh, going back to some of the stories that Kavita will say, is that often when you do give a, a grant, um, particularly uh, in, a, in a more distant way, people will always tell you you're brilliant, you're beautiful, you're um, the wisest person they've ever met, and the grant that you gave them, gave them was just perfect in every way. They rarely will tell you the truth. Uh, in fact, one of the funniest stories I had, because I spoke French and Swahili at the time, and the, I was at the bakery where a Dutch, uh, French-speaking uh, donor had bought this electric stove for this bakery that had no electricity. And um, he came in to say to the women, you know, what did you, what did you think? And how, how is it helping you? And are you using it? And the women, Prisca was the only person who spoke French. So the rest of the women would be like, tell the dog that we don't have electricity. And like, what is he thinking about? And she would say, oh, it works really well. Thank you very much. <laughs> we just thank you. you know, I was like, seriously? Um, the market teaches you very quickly whether people want something or don't want something. And yet there still needs to be this leadership humility. Uh, young, one of, we, at Acumen, we, we also invest in leaders. And so we have a leaders program from around the world. And a young leader from Uganda, Joseph Yarahanga, who came from a farming family himself, was working in Western Kenya, where we've got a company that sells hybrid seeds to about 150,000 smallholder farmers. And he was saying to us just this year how humbled he was because he went to this one household and he, the woman had no money. And so he said, look, take this packet of 501 seeds because it's drought resistant and we're probably going to have a drought this year. And uh, when you see the benefits of it, then next year you can buy the seeds. And so she agreed and he went off feeling like he had really gotten a new customer. And he said he came back a month later and the, the seeds were still sitting on the table. And he said, um, why didn't you use the seeds? And she said, well, in my culture, I can't plant these seeds until my mother-in-law plants her seeds. And you didn't give her seeds. And he said, I'm an African who lives 200 miles away from her, and I didn't know my own people. And he said, you know, to me, leadership is like um, a panicle of rice. He said, because in, the, in your prime, you're nourishing the world, and you're reaching up to the heavens, and you're bright green and beautiful. And he said, but right before the harvest, that rice bends down and touches the ground um, with humility. And he said, I'll never forget that bending down to the ground as part of what it means for me as an African man who wants to change this world, that I have to start by listening. And it was just, no Thank one could you. say it better than him. Thank you. Um, the story I shared with Margot was, um, you know, very similar in, in, in feel, but I think at the time, again, I joined the Global Fund um, in 1996, and um, the outrage in the United States in the women's movement here was all about female genital mutilation and, you know, how awful it was and what was happening to women around the continent. And the Global Fund had a major initiative um, uh, to reach out to African women, and we were um, spending time, I was spending um, two weeks in Ethiopia and Eritrea, um, places where um, the prevalence of um, FGM or female genital cutting, as it is now often referred to, um, is over 90%. Uh, and as an Indian woman, I didn't necessarily go with some of the exact same preconceptions, but I certainly went with a great deal of um, horror at the idea of what um, young girls were going through. And we had a very sobering conversation um, with women in the same community that I mentioned where you know, they talked about the value of a woman being less than a goat. And at one point, a bunch of mothers around us said, we just want you to stop for a second and we want to explain to you something. Um, there are no schools where girls can go to near and around our villages. Girls don't get beyond a primary education if they get that. The way our children eat is to know that they will get married, and that's their economic security. You don't have to tell us about all the health problems. and the, All of us have been circumcised. We know what we went through. We know the pain. We know how difficult it is. We know the issues with health. But we also know that at this point of time, a girl who is not cut 
will not be married and she will not eat. And so if we care about the future of our children, we have to care about them being able to eat. And when you can assure us that our girls can go to school and can have a job and don't then have to depend on husbands for their sort of economic uh, future, then maybe we'll have a conversation with you. That was the first comment. The second was, come, we'll show you who lives on the outskirts of our village. We went, all widows. I said, OK, well, they're all widows. Who are they? They are the cutters. What is the way in which widows sustain themselves in a poor Ethiopian village? They have both status as, you know, in terms of cultural and religious significance in the village, and they have an income, a means of generating income, because they do the ceremony. They cut the girls. They said, do you have another job for them? Do you have a program? Do you have something that they are going to do? Because how will they eat? And then the last thing, which you know, was the third of these, you know, again, very humbling and also big ahas, um, which was, why is it that all of you in the West are so worried about what happens to girls because of a result of this, but you don't seem to remember that more girls in our village die of diarrhea and lack of access to food and lack of access to clean drinking water. When you're as outraged about those deaths, then you can come and speak to us about FGM. We took that back. That was something that I think in the same way, and for me, certainly as a woman who thought of myself as someone who had grown up in the developing world, I had a very similar kind of experience of your colleague, um, which was, yeah, I thought I was going in there with all these great, you know, good ideas, and instead I was really humbled to hear how complex change really needed to be. Thank you. Thank you both. We are going to turn to questions. Um, it, it's great to hear from you both. You're doing incredible work out there. And I think we, you know, one of the takeaways that we all have is that um, women's rights are humans, human rights. And we need to remember that, as well as the compassion and the humility that goes along with it. So thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move now to questions and answers. And council rules, um, please raise your hand, wait for me to recognize you, wait for the microphone to come to you before you begin speaking. I'm also going to ask, please, that you pose a question and, not, and kind of refrain from making a long statement because we only have a few minutes for Q&A. Um, first, right up here. Yeah, my name is Cindy Burrell, and I'm with Boardroom Bound. And I don't know if this question is politically correct or not, but I've been thinking the whole time because I was in the Peace Corps many years ago. So do you work with the Peace Corps? Because so many times they know what's happening on the ground. They could be a resource. Um, I can't speak for Jacqueline, but certainly the Global Fund, yes, has worked with Peace Corps, not um, as an institution to institution, but actually many women's groups get to know about the Global Fund because a Peace Corps volunteer in their community has told them about it or has actually handwritten the application for them or has sent it off on an internet um, cafe in the, from the nearest town. So we've had uh, significant interactions with Peace Corps volunteers and um, actually a no number of our advisory council members are either current Peace Corps volunteers or former Peace Corps volunteers. Um, so the answer is yes. Yeah, I think that's really more the point, that Peace Corps volunteers tend to spend their lives somehow connected to international issues, and then they find their ways to supporting us one way or another. Um, let's go to the back. The lady with the white scarf. Hi, um, Mariela Janik with Oxygen Chicago. My question is, with studies showing us um, that women uh, equipped with a decent wage, invest 90% of their wages in their families, whereas men only invest 30 to 40% in their families. Um, what are examples of ways that we are going to engage men in the, um, in the dialogue and then participate and take action to support women? Go ahead. Um, I think the, 
you know, this is also a statistic that um, you can read in Nicholas Kristof and Cheryl Wudan's book. Um, and it's a statistic I have some concerns about because it, it is, um, while it is certainly true that men's investments are not um, used in the same, or men's income doesn't get um, plowed back into the family in the same way, I don't think it has anything to inherently do with being a man or a woman. And in fact, there are other studies that have shown that under different circumstances, um, men will invest more as well into the well-being of the family. In part, it has to do with what is the notion of how money is actually allocated within the family. So in families where men come and just give the check to the woman in the household, she is considered the person who makes the household decisions. And then he has a certain amount of discretionary income, which is in fact supposed to be used for these other discretionary things. Now, I'm not using that as an excuse, but I'm a little wary of this. You know, um, I think in 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 the in the half the sky in the in Nick Kristof's book, he says something like, you know, one of the secrets of global poverty is that you know men waste away their wages, and I think. There is, the danger in that is that quite honestly, even at upper level income levels, um, if you asked how men spend their resources and how women spend their resources, a lot has to do with what is the discretionary income in the family and who controls the discretionary income in the family as opposed to the income that actually goes into. So I think as e overall levels of economic development change and you know, as women have jobs in factories like the ones that Jacqueline and Acumen Fund are helping to um, set up, you will find a shift and you will find women being able to, when they have control over money that can be actually discretion, termed discretionary income, then that will go to other places. I think uh, where we are right now is often in a survival uh, mode. And in that mode, yes, mothers do put their money first into the well-being of their children and putting food on the table. One question over here. That's enough. Yeah. That's great. Hi. I'm sorry. Um, Maria Malzagafi. Um, my question is, in light of this large-scale displacement that we have seen due to natural calamities, for example, in Pakistan, how do you see these investment models working for these communities um, beyond relief efforts and more towards rehabilitation? Um, it's a great question. I, I just was actually um, in Pakistan. Uh, and to, to see 20, even to try to grasp 20 million people who are homeless as a result of the floods, it, it's almost too big. And to actually go and see, you literally see uh, tarpaulins, not even tents, under which families of 15 and 16 are just sitting and staring uh, now uh, into their third month. Uh, it's, it's quite extraordinary to see what's happened. I want to actually answer it on two levels. So at Acumen, we're looking at uh, taking some of our products like D-Light, which has a $10 solar, it's a $10 solar torch, and actually getting the international agencies to, um, to buy them and distribute them through the camps uh, because it's so low cost and we can move it much more quickly. In fact, uh, one of the things I really learned in Pakistan was the power of moving things through the private sector often uh, with the, uh, the international, the big organizations often, they, they get the equipment, but they sit at customs, they sit at port, or a lot of it is lost. Uh, and there's a lot of fears right now in Pakistan of money that's going through government also being lost. So we had a, my husband and I had a, a microcosm of an experience where I called one of our board members to say we were coming and was there anything that we could do and that we'd heard about this guy that had uh, a, 20, a 20 liter jerry can, a nano filter. He'd never been to the, the developing world, but thought that this was a way of bringing essentially 8 million uh, liters of clean water into the camps. And uh, our board member said, sure, you guys buy it. We'll get our Air Blue, which is their family's conglomerate, owns a, uh, uh, shares in the, the, the second largest airline, to go to Manchester, England, pick up those, those filters, bring it back to the country, um, and in three days they were fully distributed. And I really learned a lot through that and have been trying to talk to um, everybody I can 
uh, including the head of USAID and at the highest levels of State Department, to say that I think that we have a real opportunity here to change the way we look at aid. Uh, the United States has committed $1.5 billion a year to Pakistan for humanitarian efforts for the next five years. We spent $11 billion between 2001 and today. Um, most of that went to the military, and as someone who goes there three times a year for the last 10 years, I cannot show you where our aid has created real positive change, and we or know, security. or security, and we know how Pakistanis feel about Americans and vice versa. There is no trust, and yet, our organization is Pakistani um, established. It, we raise money from 35 Pakistanis who give between 10,000 and a million dollars a year to support young Pakistani leaders who are building companies by investing in Pakistani entrepreneurs who are doing unbelievable things. And to me, within our community, we can point to $150 million that the private sector Pakistanis are, are putting into creating sustainable systems for change. And I think it offers the United States an incredible opportunity to say, all right, we're all going to go to where we say, we, we use the words, but we haven't done it, and we're going to match you dollar for dollar um, into the private sector to work with NGOs primarily, but that you're accountable for, and then get the local media, they've got one of the most open, interesting media in the world, to uh, report on it daily if necessary to start changing the way that we can do this. I have seen in 10 years us build um, housing for the poor where the poor are paying back. Uh, the first commercial mortgages ever made to low income people. A housing development with 20,000 people now. Um, drip irrigation and uh, water filtration plants. That This stuff works. And people say, how can you work in Pakistan? It's so dangerous. And I, I think, well, Actually, it's one of our strongest portfolios. We can do it, but we need to take a leap and change the way we've got to not do business as usual. And at 150 million, we're, we're looking at less than 10% of our aid budget just for this year. And it would send an incredible message to the world. So if any of you know how we can like move that conversation, <laughs> um, I'm right here in the purple dress. Um, we'll take one final question. Wait, Linda. Oh, I'm Linda Johnson, and thank you so much for your talk today. Mine is just a very simple question, so I'm sitting here as one American. What can we do? How can I help? Well, that's a great thing about philanthropy, and I think um, one of the reasons Jacqueline and I feel really privileged to be able to be having this conversation with you together is that you can also see what the range of options that um, you as an individual philanthropist have available to you. I think um, both um, the Acumen Fund and the Global Fund for Women have individual investors, if you, you know, if you think of them as that, and I think of them as investors, even though we're not investing in businesses, I think we're investing in entrepreneurs and in leaders in, the, in these different communities. Um, you can do that with a bat mitzvah check of $25, which lots of young girls send to the Global Fund for our work on girls' education. And you can do it as an individual donor who can put a million dollars into an investment plan for an amazing business at Acumen. And I think um, I'm tired of people saying to me, oh, but you know, I don't want to just write a check. Checks matter. <laughs> <laughs> Checks really matter. They make what we do possible. Um, they are not insignificant. And absolutely, if you want to get more engaged than writing a check, both of our websites have tons of information about how you can actually do that, how you can travel to visit some of the groups that we've, you know, we've invested in, um, whether it's companies or whether it's um, women's organizations like the Global Fund invests in. Um, the other thing that I think we can all do is um, to talk more about, Jacqueline said earlier at a conversation we were having, that sometimes we feel awkward because we want everything to be so simple. You know, we, we want to like know, oh yes, so should we be doing microcredit or should we be doing the Acumen Fund or should we be doing the Global Fund for Women? It isn't simple. Change is really complicated and it's complicated for the reasons that we talked about. Not only that it's happening in 60 years in, in the oldest of the independent countries, India, um, but that Change requires changes at a human nature level. It requires changes at the level of um, 
you know, government and accountability. So I think one thing all of you can do is to, you know, to your friends who are like, well, you know, isn't it really micro business or isn't it only girls education? You can say, actually, there are lots of ways in which you can make an investment for change. But I think doing something as opposed to talking about it, that's also a really important piece. Um, and I think being more educated, I think what Jacqueline just said, um, about Pakistan, for me, when I read the news about Pakistan, I'm somebody who goes there every year because my husband is Pakistani and my whole family lives there, his, his whole family lives there. Um, I would like perceptions about Pakistan to change and the only way that can change is not gonna be because the New York Times does any better reporting. It's gonna be because people like yourselves read Jacqueline's blog when she comes back from Pakistan and hears what is happening with the Global Fund for Women grants to um, groups that have been doing amazing work in the midst of this. And so I would really ask that as you know, something all of you can do is get better educated about what's happening in different parts of the world and don't buy into the stereotypes you're reading in the media. If I can build on that, um, when, when we were in Pakistan, we, um, you, we took all my photographs and we made a little video out of it. And we put it to the music of Peter Gabriel. I mean, it couldn't have been more kind of schmaltzy. But we wanted to humanize Pakistanis because we were really confused that media wasn't covering it and nobody was giving money to it. Um, the, the good news was the video got seen and sent around the world to, uh, to about 70,000 times in the first uh, 10 days. The bad news is that we got over 1,000 hateful comments. Mm -hmm. um, I'm praying for rain. Uh, they're all terrorists. Why should we help them? And it really reinforced for me this idea that we all have voice and so often, when we see these YouTube things, it's always the lunatics that write the comments in. Um, but that the, the people who actually are on the, who are trying to create a more interconnected world that, that is built on the idea of hum our shared humanity, we could, we could also write those write comments, thank you, um, spreading that word. Um, we can use our Facebook pages and our blogs ourselves and sending good articles around. Um, something's been happening over the last few years that we're not even really sure we understand, which is this, um, the beginning of chapters at Acumen. And so over the last few years, more than 4,000 individuals have created chapters, in, uh, created, are part of chapters in everywhere from Sydney, Australia, to Karachi and in, in in, in Bombay to Chicago. And in fact, this very newly formed cha chapter, of which I see Nate Laurel over there, who is an Acumen Fund partner who just went with us to Kenya, uh, is holding uh, what, what they're calling a dignity event. There's another really beautiful organization called, um, uh, I just forgot the name of it, Nuru, uh, that, is, that finds incredible photographers and they um, take pictures of that, that essentially embody dignity and then they auction them off and then young people are raising sometimes 10 and $20,000 um, for Acumen and uh, I think it's being held on November 13th. Here? Somewhere. Here. Literally Where is it? In Chicago. So if you're interested, those two guys over there are the ones. Um, and we'd love to have you. And I think that this idea of joining community uh, is a really important one. Um, and on, I know both of our websites that there's this being part of something, learning, sharing. Um, and I think we've had the same experience. I mean, there was um, Pamela. Um, Agumen is here, she's our Chicago, local Chicago volunteer, there's sort of a Chicago chapter, if you will, of the Global Fund for Women. This has been the same experience we've been having. I think people really do want to do something. They want to be part of it. And they want to be part of change. And, um, you and know. These, yeah. And you two have two great ways of doing it. And, and quite honestly, if you put into Google, getting involved, getting involved Chicago, getting involved India, you will be swamped with ways to get involved very, very quickly. Anything, everything from, you know, giving the ten dollars to giving the ten million dollars, yeah. or and getting yourself involved. It is actually quite easy to do it, and it's yeah. just doing it. I, you know, you're you're quite right on that. Thank you, everybody. Well, let's thank our speaker, Jacqueline Kavita. Thank you so much, Margo. Thank you for moderating. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. And I would say if you're going to go out and spread the word, spread, a, spread the word about the Chicago Council and our Women in Global Development Forum. We do look forward to seeing all of you on Friday, December 10, for our next meeting. We're adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>